Hey, welcome everybody to this uh, last session of conversations uh, with Bart and about Bart. And this is a special session in which we're going to talk about the pastoral, practical, churchly implications of Bart's theology, um, maybe with particular rel rel uh, uh, connection with the church dogmatics. And Stanley and I are joined today by two pastors, uh, Justin Coleman, and uh, Justin is at University of United Methodist Church in Chapel Hill, uh, a, a former student of both of ours, uh, and uh, Jason is a uh, pastor in Annandale and uh, Maryland and uh, Virginia. Virginia. Virginia, whatever. And uh, uh, Jason is... Uh, the uh, lead behind the wonderful Crackers and Grape Juice podcast, which supports itself in part by selling Stanley Harawas mugs and t-shirts. <laughs> and uh, so we're great to have these two pastors with us today. Um, and at the end of this session, Karsten will be uh, sharing uh, some of the comments and we'll have time to uh, respond to that. And, connections between BART and the local church. Um, well, you know, uh, Stanley, you have said that when you're declared king of the world, uh, which may happen any day, uh, that you would, you'd like to see every pastor read dogmatics and outline every year. Uh, what good would that do? Uh, you may be right that I've said that, but I don't remember saying it. But well, you're, you're still overcoming the anesthesia from the surgery, right. so. Right. Yeah. But, you know. um, uh, I think it's very hard to remember how radical the transformation the gospel is about in terms of thinking of it. What Jesus presents is an unbelievable language transforming proposal after you have undergone um, the discipline of discipleship the world is never the same but it's constantly tempting you to think it is the same so how to embody the grammar of the gospel in a way that you don't lose what it means that this is God. <laughs> that uh, we, um, uh, we just find it hard to think this is God. How could God show up in the life of a first century Palestinian Jew? Um, who seems like a very interesting person, but God? But yet, that's what Bart constantly forces us to recognize, that this is God. It is not as if we have some conception of the biggest thing around, and we call that God but rather we learn to see that God is the one who comes in continuity with the witness of Israel across the ages to say, this is salvation, namely that you can be drawn into the life of this person in a way that saves us from the temptation to rule the world through violence. Mm -hmm. mm. I hear your cat coming in. You know, um, one of the first articles we collaborated on, Christian Century, had something like the title was Feeling Odd. It's interesting. I'm here you and saying Bard helps us sort of defamiliarize the gospel. Uh, who God is, uh, one of the 
great essays you've done is um, No Enemy, No Christianity, mm -hmm. which as a preacher, I think we preachers somehow think it's our job. Uh, here's a strange Jewish uh, scripture, uh, ancient and all. Now, uh, think about it with us in this sermon, and we will make this sound normal. We will make this sound familiar. You're saying that one thing Bart does is to defamiliarize, to to uh, recover, sustain the oddness of God. I think that's exactly uh, right, and it's a very hard thing to do because the preaching, the very structure of what it means to preach, is you quote you want to make contact with the people to whom you're preaching. And the assumption is you try to do that by showing that what they already believe <laughs> is not uh, uh, is, is not foreign to what it means to be a Christian. But exactly, that's exact, exactly that's to get mm -hmm. it wrong mm -hmm. because you want to try to show that what our lives exhibit is a kind of familiarity that um, is not appropriate given the oddness of what we are saying we believe through Christ. Mm -hmm. You, uh, Justin, you, you casually told me that you had actually used dogmatics and outline uh, with a confirmation class, this seemed odd to me, but uh, it was it was odd and maybe indeed foolish. Uh, so, you know, I spent time um, at the Divinity School with you and with Stan. Uh, even took a art seminar with with Stan, and I thought to myself, as part of the pastoral task, if if what I'm learning here is going to make a difference, I need to be able to communicate with the children of the church, uh, what I'm learning. And uh, the question for me was, am I smart enough to do it? <laughs> am I smart enough to be a translator? Hmm. And so I took uh, a couple confirmation classes. One was when I was an associate pastor years ago here at University <clears throat> Methodist Church in Chapel Hill. And, uh, and I still have in my, uh, in dogmatics and outline, I have marked out the different I think seven different sessions. I broke this up into seven different sessions and I've kind of put it up in the, in the margins there around what we were going to be talking about with the youth. And so I tried to translate Bart as best I could to the youth, youth here. And then I went to Houston and tried to do so um, in an urban context with uh, predominantly uh, African and Hispanic youth <laughs> in, a, in a youth group. Um, uh, so would BART even be uh, meaningful uh, in that context? And so I tried, you'd have to call some of them up and ask them if I was <laughs> uh, successful or if I bored them uh, to death. But, you know, my, my feeling was folks wanted to enter into this uh, deep mystery of God uh, that Bart was talking about. Oh, huh. uh, I mean, it's, it's important to remember that Justin is a Texan. And so you have a leg up because... What does that explain? Uh, because Texans uh, have understood uh, that we speak differently than other people speak. So there's a kind of dislike to be called to be part of the people of Israel uh, is to make you, uh, in a way, uh, have a leg up when it comes to appreciating what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, because you know that you're not like everyone else because you're a Jew. Uh, so Texans also have to learn the, um, how the oddness of being a Texan gives them some possibility of recognizing the oddness of what it means to be a Christian. Oh. Mm. I, I have sometimes 
giving thanks that I'm from South Carolina. And to me, that gives me a leg up in that I know we're bad. I mean, we've been bad <laughs> and we've been bad a long time and we've been like publicly shown to be bad. And uh, that can be a help. But uh, now, uh, Jason, you, you're you quite a reader of BART. Uh, has BART played a role in your ministry? Uh, yeah, um, so I didn't go to Duke. Um, and I, I read a little BART uh, as a religion major at UVA, but uh, my first sustained reading of BART came right after 9-11. Um, and, it, and it was with George Hunzinger at the same time that he uh -huh. was starting a movement against uh, the U.S. practice of torture. Um, and I think the combination of reading BART and seeing George Hunzinger apply um, BART in terms of uh, it was the first time I was able to see that if you start with what Stanley talks about as far as the point of contact, if you start with human subjectivity, um, our experience, our faith, it's hard to get from there to the preacher of the Sermon on the Mount as Lord, right? Uh, and so I think my first exposure to Bart came at that, that critical time in our, our nation when I was starting our ministry, my ministry, um, and, and realizing that Bart gave us the resources um, to proclaim a word outside of the church, but in a way that was rooted in Christ's lordship rather than just Christ's uh, solidarity with victims or, you know, cause uh, like on campus, I remember there were a lot of um, kind of artistic um, um, exemplifications of torture and things like that. And so the idea was that Jesus, you know, was also tortured, which, which is true. Um, it's just, it's, it, it doesn't have the same force of, you know, the one who told you X, Y, and Z is now the living Lord. Hmm. Um, and I think, so I think Bar I, I discovered that Bart gives preachers the resources, um, to address God's people in a way that avoids kind of partisan categories, what sound like partisan categories to hearers of sermons. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. Uh, Justin and Jason, you're both Methodist. You shouldn't have been attracted to Bart. Yeah, well, I don't know if my congregation would 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 say that I'm very Methodist, but but yeah. I, I mean, it, it's interesting to ask yeah. how uh, how uh, your attraction to Bart may signal in ways that we need to articulate uh, how Methodism uh, has been. Um, in many ways, uh, a failure in the American context. Yeah, I do. I mean, I do. Th I mean, I don't want to uh, monopolize the time, but I, I do think Bart has the resources for the moral concerns that are present in Wesley without um, the uh -huh. pietism that that Wesleyanism became. Uh huh. That's lovely said. Yeah, I think yeah. Methodism was just undefended <laughs> uh, contemporary Methodism against the subjectivity, the subjectivization of the gospel. And uh, I hadn't thought about that. In, in interesting ways, we all found Bart a helpful means of rebellion against the kind of sanctimonious piety, the subjectivism that, that Methodism had become. Um, but I do think one reason contemporary Methodism just kind of morphed into uh, sentimentality is we lacked the robust Trinitarian God that Wesley knew mm -hmm. and that Bart, but uh, Justin, you're Methodist, had well, it mixed up with Bart. Yeah, uh, so this will go back to Stan's comments about me being a Texan. So I am a Texas Methodist, uh, which means that I am uh, I grew up being very pragmatic. So Methodism was always about um, how can you succeed in culture? <laughs> so you become like whatever you need to be like in order to um, succeed in culture, have a good, large Methodist church. That's what it was about. That it drove uh, so much of our thinking. I'd like to say that I was uh, sacramentally formed. I'd like to say that uh, a kind of uh, Methodist uh, Pietism was part of my life, but really it was about how to be a successful Christian. 
from a Texas Texan point of view. Um, so then I show up at a place like Duke and I begin hearing uh, things differently than I did growing up. So this is, I mean, this kind of goes back to our Trinitarian conversation. I think you know, part of what Trinitarian uh, theology teaches us is that theology is relational. And so I became interested in BART because of the relationship that I had with um, Will and Stan. And then um, through the course of that uh, relationship, I began to discover something that um, I've got a quote here from uh, one of uh, Eberhard Bush's uh, books on BART that he did for uh, Abingdon Press, the Abingdon Pillars of Theology series. And he is, um, um, and he's lifting up a quote from a person who heard one of Bart's sermons. He says, after hearing one of Bart's sermons, the young novelist uh, Manfred Hausman wrote, I was gripped and uprooted and then turned inside out. I left the church as one who no longer knew where to go. Lightning had come down and struck me. I was staggering. Here was the revolution I had suspected all along. And wow. that's what happened to me uh, through reading Bart with um, Stan and Will. Wow. In the, um, I got up this moment, uh, this morning uh, uh, feeling bad and thinking about, let's see, with what's going on now in the news, uh, in our own communities, with the anguish people are feeling, what the heck are we doing sitting around here uh, talking about Bardian theology? I mean, what, what good does that do? Jason, you <laughs> came to Bart uh, during a climactic time, like, moment but what why are we doing this what what good is this um so i guess i would have two answers one it, it, like the the broad answer is i think it's helpful to remember that um all the major developments in bart's theology came uh as he was wrestling with making pivots in his own political engagement um and so i think bart models for preachers the theological work that is necessary to for the church to bear witness to the world um i think oftentimes you know i mean this is what you you know you complain about this all the time will that like in trying to speak a word to the world we fall in um and so i think bart bart shows you know the the the, the, the theological engagement that's necessary yes. for preachers to to engage as preachers and christians not just as participants in a, a political debate um, or a, a societal debate. Um, so I think that's one. And I think in the other, um, you know, I've always admired how the levity that Bart had in his theology, that his confidence in the finished work of Christ was such that um, he could be a very serious opponent of the way that the powers of sin manifest themselves in the world, and yet also um, caution us to not take it too seriously, to see it as a foe that's already been defeated. Um, and that's a much more freeing posture, I think, um, uh, to, to go into battle knowing you've already won. I, I all that sounds um, exactly right. I think also and to go back to the issue of language, uh, I think um, what Bart teaches you to worry about um, the image of translation. Um, what tra I mean, the idea of translation, you have to translate the gospel into terms that people can understand, underwrites the presumption that you don't need to be transformed to understand the language that the gospel <laughs> is asking you to use. <laughs> and that uh, in order to be a Texan, uh, you have to be transformed by the language that you're using. I oftentimes get when um, uh, the issue of translation comes up, I give the example of uh, if I called Will an asshole right now, 
people would think that I'm denigrating him. But if you're from uh, Texas, as Justin and I know, uh, uh, we call, males call one another an asshole after they scored a touchdown, and they mean it as a term of endearment. <laughs> so how, how you uh, are transformed to be able to understand that language of asshole within the Texas football culture uh, <laughs> is a complicated matter, not unlike yeah. learning to say Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it is weird, though. Justin is from Texas. I've never heard him. He's never referred to me that way. You guys just aren't uh, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That Probably. could be. Uh, I've referred to you in that way affectionately, but just to others. Uh, oh, oh, OK, uh, good. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Jason's comment about uh, uh, I got a letter this morning from a guy that was concerned about something I had written uh, along a Bardian vein about, we need to keep focused on larger matters. Don't waste time uh, attacking Trump in the pulpit. You've got other things to do. He said, are you calling for a greater spiritualization? Uh, don't you think we ought to speak to important uh, public issues? I did think Jason's account of the effect Bart had on him, uh, that that's something that in a moment like we are now, uh, Bart, I think, would have us pastors say, one, how do you know what time it is? I mean, how do you, how do you name the present moment? What is this about? And that is a very important thing for Bart. Two, when Bart, uh, Jason makes the point, a lot of Bart's big moves came about in a time of crisis, political crisis, international crisis, social crisis. And yet, uh, and when Bart says, we must stay focused on the great acclamations of the gospel and not be jerked around by that crisis, he is responding to the crisis, but he's also saying to the church, the way the church responds to that crisis may be different than the way the world responds. And Justin, I mean, I, do you find yeah. help there? Well, I do. I mean, I just, I think that for Bart and for um, <laughs> so many theologians throughout history, you know, we respond to the culture that we live in. It's, you, it's, um, you, can, you can try to believe that you stand outside of it, but I don't know that it's faithful uh, to uh, try to stand outside of it, right? And uh -huh. so, you know, what I, I think Bart does is uh, reminds us to take scripture very seriously. Mm -hmm. This is what I love about Bart is he is a pastor who is obsessed with the, how God is speaking, uh, through the word is revealed in Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's obsessed with the mystery of this. And this is what gives him insight to speak to the cultural moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was seeing in the, in the Q&A, and it was certainly on my mind waking up this morning, I mean, will you ask, why, sh why should we have this conversation? So I woke up this morning thinking, all right, I'm going to uh, talk to uh, a couple uh, older white fellas and a younger white dude about uh, uh, an old uh, dead uh, white dude uh, in the time at the time in which I also woke up um, anxious about what I might have learned has happened across the night. Mm -hmm. uh, so why in the world do any of that? Well, Barman was also on my mind uh, this morning, and it certainly seems to be on the mind of uh, several of folks who are, are gathered. And so, um, so then I began to think about, so, you know, what would Bart say about Christian responsibility here in this moment? And I'm really interested in what uh, Stan and Will, you think, uh, um, uh, what you think about this moment, uh, how similar it is to a Barman moment. I, I'm thinking about that all the time. 
right now. And I thought when uh, Trump um, came um, and I, I can't remember what the date was. It's, uh, I've been making some notes about it. It was um, on May the 22nd. And he came and said he was ordering the churches to open mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. and meet. Um, uh, that seems like such a um, small business. But I couldn't help but think when the state begins to use Christianity as a way to confirm people's um, uh, need for uh, pastoral care, um, and, and see, but, you know, they need relationship with God and this sort of thing. When the state starts telling you that you're good for the state, you're in deep trouble. Yeah. And when it's the not you you're essential. When the uh, state tells you you're essential. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not. And so you're like a bar. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, you think, well, gee, you know, it's not at the same level of seriousness of, uh, of opposing the Holocaust. But at least structurally, it sounds a hell of a lot like Barman, <laughs> or why you need Barman, and um, and what therefore is partly revealed in all that is um, how the accommodated character of Christianity in America, both in some ways in the left and the right, gives you um, uh, a church that's incapable of producing a barman. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I mean, I think that's partly where we are right now, Justin. Well, I mean, I, I think uh, for me, a highlight was when the Bishop of Washington mm. uh, stood there and, and rebuked uh, Trump. Uh, How dare you take our Bible? Uh, that that we stand in judgment under right now, uh, we Christians, how, how dare you take that as a political prop? Uh, you know, that that is deeply offensive. But I thought at that moment also, I bet Bart would have a say, uh, good for you, absolutely. Uh, the worst thing he did wasn't just tear gassing the demonstrators and so mm -hmm. he could have a photo op with his minions, but um, uh, uh, the worst thing he did was when he took, you know, the Bible and, and used it as a prop. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I mean, that's a clear Barman moment, I think. I mean, I think that, people that forget that a, like Barman yeah. was about the first commandment more than anything. Yeah, uh, and, and, but I hear Bart at the same time, uh, like Barman saying, now just remember now, you, your biggest problem is not Trump. Uh, remember that once you finally get him out of office, you're still going to be stuck with American history, with American culture. You're going to still be stuck with you. And, and just, um, I was going to a conference on prophetic preaching, which those kind of conferences always bring out the worst in preachers like me. And, um, <laughs> But, but I was just, I was all fired up and I had a kind of anti-Trump message and I was always, I was ready to roll. And on the way to the airport, I heard the great theologian, uh, Dave Chappelle, uh, said, uh, just want you white folks to remember now, uh, Trump didn't invent racism, okay? And, and he has made no significant contribution to your racism. Just want y'all to remember that. And, and I... I don't know if that's true anymore. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, like as of I, last week. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe maybe he has made some modest contribution. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I do, um, when Bart talks about the lordless powers, mm. he wants us to take the lordless powers, uh, like whether it be the U.S. Constitution, Trump and all, with appropriate seriousness for the 
for the damage and havoc they wreak. But he also wants to keep saying, but, but you know who the Lord is and he shall reign. And um, maybe in the present moment, that's a word uh, that, that also needs to be heard that nevertheless, Jesus Christ is Lord and our little Lord let's or not. So I haven't, I haven't been as brave as Justin in teaching dogmatics and outline of my confirmation students, but one part of Bard that I have always taught confirmation students is the threefold <laughs> form of the word of God. Um, you know, and seeing that picture of the president in front of the church holding up a Bible that's not even his that he hasn't read um, in front of a church he doesn't <laughs> attend. Um, you know, I, I thought that, you know, if every church member in America just under, like learned the threefold form of the word of God, mm -hmm. they would be able to deconstruct that image as idolatry. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, Jason, I don't know, um, you know, how you experience this. I take it your experience is, is similar to mine in that, um, you know, the, the theology of the church has uh, come under suspicion because of the perceived and real weddedness between uh, the state and the church. Mm -hmm. And so, again, this is kind of what leads us into a barman moment. I, I also wonder if, you know, if we are in a barman moment, how do we, um, how do we even do more than barman did? And I say that because one of the critiques of the barman uh, declaration is that in, in none of the, and none of the sections did it actually appropriately address uh, anti-Semitism, which, you know, Bart acknowledges and later says that he wishes there had been uh, more there. And so, you know, one of the things that I've seen uh, a lot prior to this last week is, so we might push against um, uh, certain entanglements between the church and uh, and America, but it's really hard for the church to become articulate about uh, racism or articulate about uh, anti-Semitism when we're formulating these kinds of important statements. And I mean, until we get at what's undergirding or what's feeding um, the problems that we see uh, politically, then we actually don't, um, we're not actually getting at the root. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, you know, what would today, what would a de Barman declaration look like that actually addressed anti-Semitism? Is that question clear enough? Mm -hmm. That's a great question for Stanley. I, um, I think racism is almost impossible to get at because the very attempts to deny race reproduces it. Namely, you condemn racism, which is rightly to be done, yet the very fact that you condemn it reproduces it as a reality that exists that shouldn't exist. Mm. So how do you, how do you become people who share a common destiny through the narrative of the cross and resurrection that makes you more determinative a follower of Christ rather than white. And that is a challenge that I think we just don't know how to um, uh, make part of our lives. Mm. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing I can do about being white. But I mean, it's there. And of course, it's, my people say it's true that the very fact that you're white privileges you in ways that African Americans are not privileged. <laughs> I mean, I do, I, I think, you know, like African-American friends I've had who, who are pastors, um, one thing I've noticed over the years is that the story of the gospel and cross and resurrection and 
the active agency of the Lord in the world are more appreciated in the black church than they are in the mainline church. Um, and to that extent, we're, we're not occupying the same story. Um, you know, so, so I think, uh, one of the things we can do is, is, is to try to catechize our mainline people back into that story so that they can see who they share the story with. Um, mm. You know, and then, and, and then like speaking of Bart, I, I think we hear often how, you know, Bart's appreciation of Forbach's critique that when we talk about God, we're just talking about ourselves with a loud voice. Um, but Bart also took Forbach's critique seriously that the problem with liberal idealism was that it didn't, it didn't hopefully engage the problems of the world around, around yeah. him. Progressivism that allegedly, you know, as Christians we're supposed to support, is inexorably white. <laughs> and, and, and how to name that means um, that you're challenging fundamental commitments by Christians in a way that would make us very different than we currently are. Like it, it's, hard, it's hard to tackle racism when you no longer believe in sin. I mean, that's mm. right. And, and yeah. yeah. Um, can we bring in uh, maybe uh, some of our uh, listeners, uh, some of their comments at this point, or questions? Karsten? Yeah. One, I think one of the things that comes up here, um, as we're, especially as we're talking about dealing with the current situation, is what a um, a Christian, say a, a Bardian Christian or a Bardian pastor, um, understands that relationship between like radical politics, like Bart's own, where he was like the red pastor, right? Mm. Um, and social activism and how all of that fits in um, so that you're not just then falling into a quietism. If y'all could talk a little bit about that, that might be helpful. <clears> hmm. <throat> You know, I'd say um, that, um, so I don't know that, so I used to call myself Bardian, <laughs> and, and mostly because, uh, you know, reading Bart and then being around a lot of folks who call themselves Bardian, I just, I wanted to be in the club, right? Uh, and but now I just, call, I might be Bardian-ish now because I, I think what helps is to read, to be able to be read Bart and then to be able to read Cone alongside uh, one another, All right? So James Cone wrote his uh, doctoral dissertation on, on Bart. And, and so here's a, here's a difference. So, so, you know, when Bart um, says things like, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not, quoting directly here, but, you know, Bart wants us to be able to talk about the word without being caught up in our own stories. Not make it about us, make it about God, right? And, um, you know, what I might say is, golly, that's just a very white thing to do, because you believe that the framework that you're speaking from is, um, is not uh, is is the point of view uh, of which everything else is relative, right? You know, um, but if you're an African American doing theology, you tell stories because um, you you believe you're a story form. You believe that the stories matter, and you at least always got to be able to articulate your story over against uh, the stories of of white culture and so on and so forth. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, in order to develop the kind of activism uh, we might want, we've got to read Bart alongside others. And so I'd say, look, read uh, dogmatics in outline and then, um, you know, read the cross and lynching tree or something like that. Just read, read Bart parallel with someone who's also reading Bart and inhabiting a different space. And so I'd commend Cone to you. I'll, I'll tell you a story um, about that. Um, 
when I, my first meeting of the Society of Christian Ethics was at the International Theological School in Atlanta. And uh, it was centered around issues of race being in that context. And Cohn's uh, Black Power and Black Theology had been published. And uh, of course, it was very controversial. And um, um, there was a session on it. Uh, and one of the papers was um, uh, to be given and was given by the social ethicist at uh, Duke, whose name I'm suddenly blocking. Will, who, who, uh, uh, he, uh, he, oh, he, uh, oh, he was Beach, Waldo oh, Beach. Waldo Beach, yeah, yeah. And, and Waldo, who had written quite powerfully against segregation and written an article, Segregation is Sin, um, though on reading Cone, was taken back because he said, this is reverse racism. And he, he said, you know, we don't want to embody uh, that and then uh, Cone, of course, reacted vehemently against Waldo, and then it was a very contentious back and forth between people uh, in the room. And finally, uh, toward the end, I, I was sitting on the floor. I raised my hand and I said, "I these are all very interesting questions, but I want to raise the question of." how did you think you could combine a Bardian Christological move with the Telikian views of symbols? And he said, I don't anymore think you can do that. And that's the reason I'm giving Bard up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and what bothered me about Cone mm. is he was more Telikian than he was Bardian in that mm. one. Now, how, how you get at those kinds of issues without without at the same time saying no cones emphasis uh, on race is absolutely right uh, those are the kinds of uh, challenges that I um, I don't know that we respond to very well uh, Carson mentioned the viewers uh, talking about quietism versus activism and all I'm in the present moment I've had just about enough of articles in the Christian century and elsewhere uh, extolling the virtues of monastic spirituality and sitting quietly <laughs> in your nice backyard and thinking about uh, Jesus or whatever um, Bart was pretty ruthless in his critiques of mysticism, as he called it. And uh, I, one thing that bothers me about such talk is it's often class and race mm -hmm. dependent, mm -hmm. as is my theology, I'm sure, in ways that could be pointed out to me. But uh, just, I like Bart's, this, this view of this dynamic God. Uh, uh, by the way, you may be overwhelmed by current events. You may be tempted to sit in the, your backyard and practice interiority. Well, God doesn't, okay? God is going to be active whether you are or not. Uh, so you can join into that or you can let it bypass you. And um, so he... And, and Bart was not, un like, I, I mean, I think, you know, like Bart's personal witness is such that if you're reading him that leads to quietism, you're reading him wrong. Yeah. Right. You know, and that, uh, absolutely. And, and that his whole project was how, yeah. how, how do you, how do you have a, yeah. how do you have a politically engaged Christian witness that doesn't lead to liberalism? And, and isn't it ironic that Bart kept saying, don't, don't talk about my background and, and my, uh, my story is just not, of interest. Well, as Eberhard Bush has shown and others, it, it's virtually, it's inconceivable that one can read Bart without reading the context in which he wrote, 
the things that he's reacting against, even when he says, I'm not going to talk about Hitler, he is, Hitler is busy determining the shape of his rhetoric and his thought. And uh, so... Oh, he knew he knew he was socially engaged from from uh, the get go. There was there was no yeah he yeah, he, no he wasn't offensive about it at all because he knew uh, the what the price he was paying and the thing was part of the part of the problem was Reinhold Niebuhr. I mean Niebuhr said that Bart was not socially engaged, which only showed that he didn't have any sense of Bart's engagements, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, not only in Germany, but in Eastern Europe and, and so on. They, they all got upset because he wouldn't come out vehemently um, criticizing the Soviet communist ideals. Um, and, and he had close uh, ties with Marxist uh, like uh, and Czechoslovakia. So uh, when, when he preached his great sermon uh, about Israel and the church and we as uh, those invited into that promise in, in Bonn at the university, uh, many in the congregation walked out during the sermon. And uh, the next morning, Bart sent a copy of the sermon to Hitler uh, <laughs> saying, I'm I'm, I'm told that you will find this of interest. Uh, and, and Bart claimed that he was kind of shocked Hitler never responded. Uh, and, and somehow that kind of wonderful, astute naivete. Uh, Karsten, have you got any other questions? Yeah, so if um, contemplating your compost in your um, suburban backyard isn't enough of a practice um, Come on. to transform the world, um, I wonder what one question was about what kinds of practices um, so much of y'all's work has been about, you know, just being the church as its own politics. Um, so what kinds of practices um, does the church need to inhabit, embody, um, renew in this time to be the, the kind of political witness that we need to be? I think there's nothing more important than for congregations to hold pastors to the discipline of telling the congregation the truth about who they are. Uh, I, um, I uh, think that uh, that's something that uh, simply isn't done today. And for um, a renewal of the sermon as a truth embodied medium that makes possible Christian understandings of the world that are not just a repeat of, of liberal presumption is um, one, of the, one of the things that has to be done. Mm. Justin, what would you say? What's a practice? Uh, I am. Um... I'm actually not going to answer your question because I'm thinking about another one. I'm sorry. No, oh, okay. okay. no I'm going I'm to want to come back to this. Hmm. I'm still, I'm caught just because I'm caught. I'm caught <laughs> around contemplation and, 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 and contemplative action. So we, there used to be uh, at a church I served a, a wonderful labyrinth with, that was made out of uh, uh, boxwoods. So a clergy person I served with said, you know, I just don't have a contemplative bone in my body. I just get a lawnmower and go straight from the entryway to the exit and that's, and then I can move on, you know, uh, but I do think that there is a kind of active contemplation that I see in Bart. I mean, you don't, you can't write uh, church dogmatics in circle the Trinity <laughs> linguistically like Bart does without a kind of contemplation. I mean, that for me, that is a kind of contemplation and a kind of meditation, an active one, but it, but it is one. And so, um, and so I, in, in a way, I just want to reframe what contemplation means and say that I think that Bart was deeply contemplative. You don't, 
you cannot get that revelation that hovers over the word uh, in the way that Bark talks about without being in some kind of way contemplative. So, sorry, I, I was just caught there and and all right, I've can't answer another question till I get all out. All right, I've been rebuked, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, wait, wait, I uh, yeah, Jason, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I mean, what Justin just said made me, you know, that I, I think, you know, Stanley, you're one of your main focuses is on the importance of prayer. And I think for Bart, you know, that, that's not just a throwaway line. It's, it's that prayer is where you see most clearly the, the futility of our actions apart from the, you know, the living God at work in the act of prayer. And so I think contemplation understood that way, rather than just stuff we do to work our way up to God, um, I, I think is entirely appropriate but I, I think you know this question in relation to the last question about quietism um you know there's a clergy colleague i know that i saw on twitter uh over the weekend he he's a pastor in minneapolis and you know and so he he had a video someone took a video of him he was a peacekeeper for the protesters uh protecting the protesters and so there was a short video of him um stopping uh some white guy who had a gun um that was in the crowd and kind of talking him back um, and out of the crowd, um, you know, and that's, you know, and, and, and I think it would be a mistake to, to read Bart in a, such a way that that isn't uh, an acceptable form of Christian witness, Absolutely. Um, you know, so that there are like, so, so I think it's, it's as long, you know, like Bart for me provides, <clears throat> guard, Bart for me provides guardrails to make sure that in engaging the world, I'm not just giving my own politics a Jesus flavor. Um, mm you know, um, yeah. or, or, or that I'm, so, so I, I think, yeah. Your, your mention of prayer, I remember on your Crackers and Grape Juice podcast, you tell me that Stanley had been criticized in some of his theological essays or writing or something for not being clearly enough engaged with uh, scripture or uh, just something like that. And you said, uh, check out his prayers. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. one of the problems I have with what passes for spirituality or contemplation in a lot of quarters these days, is it the vagueness? It's not Christologically focused. What, what Justin, what you said, I think is very helpful. Bart, Bart's whole dogmatics is contemplation of Christ. And you keep walking around the Christ and looking at it from different angles. Then you walk around again when you talk about redemption and you walk around again when you talk about the word of God. Um, and that Stanley's prayers strike us as uh, so actively engaged with the stuff of the faith, the specifics, mm -hmm. the, uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, contemplation because you think you lead an anxious life and need some serenity. Well, how could Jesus possibly care about any of that? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we, prayer is partly caring about what Jesus cares about. And uh, <laughs> uh, one more uh, uh, interaction there, Karsten. Yeah, so I guess to kind of wrap all this up into a nice, tidy little bow, um, this Sunday is Trinity Sunday, um, and I'm, I'm preaching Sunday, and I suspect some of y'all maybe as well. So maybe if we could talk a little bit about what kinds of, um, maybe not a sermon abstract necessarily, but at least a few truthful sentences <laughs> that you think you might preach. Hey, Justin, are you going to preach on the Trinity? <laughs> You know, this is uh, this has been the big question that my uh, the rest of the worship team um, uh, have, have been asking me, because yeah, and, and yes, the answer is yes, uh, and so I'll be preaching on uh, the Trinity and how the Trinity critiques our understanding of race. Um, wow. Okay. So, uh, Jason. Yeah, uh, you'll. Uh, yeah, Jason, go. Okay. Uh, I'm not preaching, but uh, I mean, so, I mean, to pick, piggyback on what Justin said, I think, you know, I, I would go with either, you know, the Trinity is a community of difference and peace, 
Um, and, and, and that is a, therefore that's a critique of, of our church, not let alone our culture. Um, but then I think, you know, maybe, um, the Trinity is, you know, a, a shorthand for the father sending the son and the son sending the spirit and the spirit sending us to bear witness, uh, to what Christ has done. Um, and so, you know, to where, to where are we sent to bear witness right now, mm -hmm. um, to this wound in the world? The missions of the spirit. Stanley, what do you think we ought to talk about on Trinity Sunday? The worst sermon I ever heard was in um, uh, was in Minnesota. Oh, I thought you were going to say Duke where, Chapel, where, 1978. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was at an Episcopal church that I'd gone oh, gone to because I was at a conference, and the. Uh, Rector came in and said, well, this is Trinity Sunday, and we all know from James Pike that Trinity is completely incoherent uh, uh, understanding of God, but I'll try to do my best with it because um, uh, the church t says we should. Uh, the way I want you to think about Trinity is um, my wife loves me, my dog loves me, my son loves me. They each love me in different ways, and that's the Trinity. So, uh, you know, you couldn't have wanted a more modalist account. Uh, that, Did that person <laughs> know you were in the uh, in the congregation? <laughs> uh, no, uh, he, he had no idea. Someone uh, who would preach a sermon like that doesn't know who Stanley is. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's true. Uh, exactly, he wouldn't know Stanley. He didn't know him. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so I, I wanted to kill the son of a bitch. But, uh, <laughs> the, but, uh, and that's but, not a good attitude to have at the end of a service. Oh, um, it's not a good attitude. But what, what uh, I want is for us to be able um, uh, to not be under the uh, power of such idiots. Uh, but mm -hmm. rather to um, have people who understand that Trinitarian claims about God transform the way we must be in the world, namely as a people who represent the story of God that helps us recognize that this is a hell of a fight and we sure as hell better be ready to be patient because mm -hmm. God is patient in cross and resurrection yeah. and that's our future and without it uh, life is just shit mm. uh, put that on a t-shirt Jason um, <laughs> I would say, if you preach on Trinity Sunday, I, I like the way Stanley has ended there. I mean, what what difference does it make that God is who God is? And I'm thinking about a man I heard interviewed, I think it was in Atlanta, and he was out in the streets, and the voice of despair saying, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm 50 years old, and when this person was killed and then that person, he said, I'm now 50 years old, said, it's obviously the government ain't gonna do anything about it, doesn't care. Our mayor doesn't care, the police, uh, I got nothing. Uh, why shouldn't I be out here in the streets? I've been out of work three years. Um, <clears throat> I got a grandson and I realize this is the world, you know, I thought, among other things, that's a call for theology, a call for who is God. Uh, it, it's it's a statement about reality, and that man's reality, my heart went out to him and thinking about, gee, I, I hope there's somebody who can tell him, by the way, God is not who you think God is. Here's God. This Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is is God for you, and active, and that this is the foundation of the world. Well, anyway, 
Um, it shows it shows though that like our preoccupation with being helpful in the mainline church yeah betrays a certain level Wilkes. of privilege uh i heard a couple of terrible sermons this weekend where <laughs> preachers uh they were correct uh they were based on the scripture a text now admittedly they may have been recorded a week or two ago but no recognition uh of of the pain and the hurt and the anger uh, it, it, in so many places uh, it, it, in our town. And and I just thought, you know, there's, there's a theological price for that kind of preaching, mm -hmm. which kind of says, hey, God is all some vague thing out there. It, it is not the one who came among us as this Jew from Nazareth who lived briefly and died violently and rose unexpectedly. Uh, speaking of that, Stanley and I are coming back in the last three Tuesdays in July. We're going to talk about another BART work that we think has great relevance and significance, uh, The Humanity of God. Uh, three essays that BART did came out uh, back uh, about 1960 in English translation. And uh, we've had such an amazing response to these conversations we've decided to come back in July. And uh, Tuesdays at 10 o'clock, last three Tuesdays in July, Karsten will be letting you know more about those details and how you can link in. Hope some of you will join us. Uh, Stanley, can you uh, pray for us? Let me well, first quick of all, we need to... Before, uh, before you pray, Stan, yeah. there's a book on uh, prayer. It's called 50 Prayers. Uh, mm -hmm. Carl Bart uh, wrote during his pastoral ministry, generally follows the lectionary uh, year. I'd highly thank uh, you. Recommend it to you. <clears throat> uh, that read along with Stanley's prayers. Prayers. Um, what? Plainly, plainly, plainly spoken. spoken. Yeah, yeah, plainly spoken. Uh, mm -hmm. Great suggestion, Justin. And thanks, Justin and Jason, for joining us today. Stanley, would you pray for us? Okay. God of power and truth. The truth is, is we don't know how to pray in the face of the world in which we currently confront. What does it mean to pray for peace when peace can only result in further terror against a people whose lives have known nothing but terror. Help us be brothers and sisters in Christ through such a time that there might be on the other side something called salvation. Thank you for helping Carl Bart help us to know how to wait. In the meantime, may we face our deaths with courage in a manner that testifies to the fact that we have nothing better to do than to be in love with you and in the process with one another. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.